a shark specialist, he has earned the trust of local fishers. Thanks to the long-standing relationships Afonso has developed, the Sedna's mission leader, Jean Lemire, is allowed to experience life aboard a long liner. These fishing boats are frequently portrayed as the source of all evil. Our old ideas of the sea and products of the sea are a thing of the past. The fishing techniques we use today are like warfare, a war we are waging against fish. This long liner alone will cast nearly 100 kilometers of line, containing thousands of baited hooks. The line is reeled in every 12 hours over the next three weeks. This represents over 40 periods of intensive fishing, regardless of conditions. Although this fishing technique is not highly selective, the fishers are primarily seeking swordfish, a large predator that fetches good prices. Fishing boats have operated in these rich waters for years. But despite the use of ever more effective fishing techniques, catches are declining. Today, far fewer swordfish and other large fish are caught in the waters off the Azores. And it's the same around the world. Yet fishing pressure today is greater than ever. The largest fish are preserved on ice to supply the insatiable market for fresh fish. Since a fishing trip lasts at least three weeks, the fish sold in supermarkets have often been caught a month earlier. Current regulations specify a minimum catch size for swordfish. Legally, smaller fish must be thrown back. But in general, these young swordfish are cleaned and frozen to be sold later. This practice is illegal. Biologist Gonzalo Grassa often serves as a scientific observer on fishing boats. How can we avoid that situation where, you know, they are catching fish that are too small? That's, a, that's probably difficult, right? Yeah, yeah well, the, one of the ways can be increase the size of the, the hook. And, and there are several kinds of, of hooks. There are, there are some twisted and, uh, well, but when they use another kind of hook, they don't catch so many, so many fish. And they prefer to catch a little bit more fish, but smaller than no fish. Fishermen dispute this regulation on fish size. They contend that since most of the young swordfish are already dead when they haul them aboard, they don't see why they should be forced to throw them back. With no one enforcing the regulation, young swordfish continue to be caught. The long line. Long lining is fishing at an industrial scale. It's a perfect example of everything that's wrong with fishing. It's a world unto itself where companies do practically whatever they like. It's like a city without a police force that's controlled by gangs and mobsters. It's incredible. The major decline in swordfish stocks has given rise to a new market, shark fishing. Long viewed merely as accidental catches, what fishermen call bycatch, sharks were thrown back because of their low market value. But the expansion of the lucrative shark fin market has changed all that. The fishery, at least in the Atlantic, shifted from a swordfish fishery to a blue shark and swordfish fishery. 
And actually, nowadays, the European fleet depends on the blue shark to make a living. The commercial fishing industry now relies heavily on the significant revenue earned from shark fins. Sharks are no longer considered bycatch, and fishers are directly targeting the blue shark, an abundant species in oceans all over the world, to compensate for lower revenues from declining fish stocks. Unlike swordfish, most sharks are still very much alive when they are hauled aboard. But the size of the animal does not appear to be a factor for sharks. Even the young ones end up in the ship's hold. The way fisheries are controlled out here in the open sea, it's no man's land. It's everyone take all. Everything is for free. And that isn't changing yet. And I think that is something that many countries have to work on. The United States, the Economic Union, Australia, which is a big fishing nation. And, you know, we need to get together and change the way fishery policy is established. From a regulatory standpoint, there is a huge difference between the kind of shark fishing done on this long liner and finning, the practice of removing only the shark's fins before throwing the animal back to sea. Horrific images of finning have been shown around the world, and public opinion has turned against this cruel practice. More and more countries now ban shark finning. Our campaigns have had major impact in Costa Rica. For instance, we were able to create laws against shark finning. There's a real famous law now that you can only allow sharks to be brought to port if they have the fin attached to the body. And this law is known as the Costa Rican anti-shark finning law. And right now we have six countries following this law, Ecuador, Colombia, El Salvador, the United States. And right now in the Economic Union, there are discussions to also impose this law. You must bring the shark with the fin attached. And shark finners say, oh, you can't do that because if the shark is frozen, you can't take the fin off. And we have proven in Costa Rica that it is, it is all a lie. You can bring sharks frozen to port. You can remove the fin. It can be done. Whoever says it can't be done is because they're shark finning, and it's very uncomfortable for them to do it any other way. When we started these campaigns, 400 foreign longline boats from Taiwan would land their products in Costa Rica every year. Now we're down to 70 or 80. Unfortunately, I don't think we can really call it a victory until we push them out of Central America and hopefully out of the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Faced with increasing public pressure, shark fishers must now keep the entire body of the shark, which is frozen and sold. This major change to the regulations means that most of the fish is now utilized. In practical terms, this kind of shark fishing is completely legal. Before, the meat of blue shark was considered to be uh, useless. Now we have a market to carry this meat, this protein, and distributed uh, as a wide variety of products, of fish byproducts, from fish sticks to fish meal. Blue shark carcasses and their precious fins are now propping up an industry that can no longer support itself because of its own past abuses. But what are the long-term consequences of intensive fishing on blue shark populations? The international agencies say that stocks vary between very overexploited in the Mediterranean Sea, for example, to um, intensively exploited in the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, it's not the most threatened uh, shark population uh, in the, in the globe, for sure. But there are concerns as to the, uh, the point at which it can withstand the current levels of exploitation. The expansion of industrial fishing is like a red stain spreading over the world. 
ces expansions qui partent autour de... It starts in Western Europe. And Russia plays an important role, as does North America. It then spreads to the African coasts, and then to the South Atlantic and South Pacific. It spreads like a skin disease. And this wave, this red tide, gets to the Antarctic, and it stops, because it can't go any further. There's no future in fishing. Too many restrictions, and the finger is always pointed at us. No matter what we do, it's always our fault. So I don't see much of a future in it, especially shark fishing. No more sharks, no more fishing. All that's left is to break the ships apart and burn them. The fishing fleets have grown in the past decades dependent on subsidies from governments. That is, the real cost involved in sending a fishing vessel out there with all the costs in fuel, in gear, in paying the crewmen, etc., is just not uh, overturned by the real profit that the catch is going to make in the market. And the only reason why that fleet or that particular vessel is doing its everyday fishing is because it gets subsidies from all of us taxpayers to lower the cost of those, uh, uh, of those items. The destruction of marine ecosystems is being financed in part by government subsidies amounting to anywhere from 20 to 30 billion dollars a year. Yet it is completely conceivable that this money could be used to remove boats from the fishing fleet and retrain the fishermen. This would result in a smaller fishery that is sustainable and profitable. If we would be to take all the subsidies to the fishing fleets all over the world, and in particular in developed countries, most of those fleets would stop the day after. If the fishing industry is committing suicide, we must prevent that. But then we should declare it incompetent, if you will. If a system is not working, we should take charge of it, not let it spontaneously self-destruct. In the Mediterranean, fishing is banned for two months, and fishermen are compensated. Why don't Portugal and Spain do like Italy? Why not stop for two months in the summer? The fishing authorities know very well what goes on in the Mediterranean. We could protect our species like they do. And they don't even have quotas. But they make us throw fish under 25 kilos back to sea. Italy's part of Europe, isn't it? If the fish is alive, we remove the hook and return it to the water. If it's caught by the belly, we use it for bait. But if it's dead, what can we do? Bring it back to life? Of course not. So we keep it. It means more income, even if we're not allowed to keep it. We tell them that it was already dead, but they don't care. They say it's illegal, that they can't tell for sure if it was dead or not. And they fine us anyway. The businessmen are in charge of establishing the policy. And of course, their policy is always considering their own pockets. What we need is fisheries directed with the public interest, with science in mind. How many boats can fish this resource? When should we stop fishing? Where should we not fish? then even if it hurts somebody's pocket, we must stop fishing. How am I supposed to make a living? Offer me a good job and I'll stop. Offer me a job that lets me come home at night and I'll take it.
The time spent on board with these fishermen was a troubling experience. It is difficult not to question the morality of this new market for shark flesh. At the current market price, fishermen only get less than a dollar a kilo, a tiny fraction of the price obtained for shark fins. At this price, is it a real and profitable market, or is it a way to skirt around the new laws adopted by numerous countries to forbid finning? The good relation between fishermen and scientists is crucial to solve this big challenge we have in, in mind. First of all, we already talked about how important it is to get these crucial data. But there's no way you're going to get these crucial data without the collaboration between, the active collaboration between these two agents. Because many times it's the fishermen that allow you to have access to those data. So that is absolutely crucial to start with. Uh, secondly, the fishermen themselves have a lot of knowledge that very often is on the base of the scientific knowledge itself. So you will never get that knowledge if there is no trust between uh, uh, those two actors. So that needs to be part of the deal. Our oceans have been patient. They have been patient with us. But now, the demand is becoming increasingly unrealistic. It's not hard to imagine a day when fishing will be mostly artisanal. There will be fewer fishermen because they won't be needed. Fish will be a luxury item, something you pay a premium for to eat on special occasions, like a Christmas turkey. Thank you.